Well, uh, welcome everybody to the final session, which is also the finale in a way. And in particular, so far we've heard a lot of academic research, which I think has been first class across a range of issues. But we really wanted this final panel to be a round table, though it's a square table, um, <laughs> to really think through what are we missing? And what are the areas that the scholarly research could potentially contribute to a lot of the work which is done by all the major organizations focused in this field? How can we really bring up some new issues, some new types of data, some new evidence, some new things which, uh, again, everybody would really like us to do? So instead of formal talks, what we're going to go around is uh, a couple of minutes each from each of our perspectives to suggest to us uh, what you'd like to prioritize, what are the urgent problems in the field of electoral integrity that you think we could potentially contribute towards, uh, what would you like us to really change our agenda? Maybe, Stefan, you're next to me. Would you like to kick off? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. I, I found this these last two days been extremely useful, fascinating, and, and uh, I will return to, to Zimbabwe tomorrow afternoon with some, uh, some new arguments when I'm discussing in my discussions with the EMB about why they need to, to shape up for, uh, for the uh, elections in, in two months' time. There are a couple of areas where I see, from my perspective, and, and where we could really benefit and, and, and use additional uh, help from, uh, from your end. Um, three areas. When is uh, election costs? Um, a second one dealing more with uh, proper indicators or good indicators for identifying potential electoral fraud. And the third one is something I believe that uh, this project will be working on a bit down the road, but that's voter education. But first, let me mention a few words about uh, election cost and then uh, I think it was Alistair that uh, had a very good paper on, on, on the costs. Often, when we are in, in the field, we've been asked by donors and, and others, the budget that we're looking at right now, does that make sense or not? How is this an expensive election? Are they trying to introduce things that are not realistic? Is it sustainable? And what it boils down to, it, when we're trying to do make some sort of comparison is, what are the variables that we include when we talk about election costs? Up until now, a lot of focus has been on election day, maybe the campaigning, but not the electoral cycle. Not also, for instance, what are the costs whether you have in an international, sorry, an, an independent election management body? If you have a, a government run one, a lot of the costs are sort of hidden because there are normally civil servants that are working as election administrators, but that's covered by a completely different minister. And what about the security? I mean, in some places, by law, there are going to be a police officer outside the polling stations. In other places, that's not the case. So sometimes it's difficult to make comparison uh, because the... the uh, the variables that have been included are not standardized. I mean, we should have at least some sort of a, this is the minimum package if you're looking at the, the cycle. But then also, sometimes they do major investments in a lot of countries when it comes to, for instance, their voter registration. They want to introduce biometric voter register in order to reduce the, the, the possibility of, of, of uh, multiple registrant. And that's an investment not just for the up upcoming election, usually for two cycles of elections. So how do we deal with this massive investment that could be sometimes up to half of the election budget? That's completely skews our data and how we compare it. So I'm really interested to see, see more work when it comes to election, election cost, and how we measure that properly. Um, also been fascinated by, by the discussions about second digits, Bedford laws, and, and, and these kind of things as, as indicators for potential uh, fraud. And, and, and that sort of goes up as a warning flag for us, and, and we need to see then as administrators, is that really fraud or is it more malpractice? Because if it's malpractice, maybe it's better training. If it's fraud, maybe we need to have a different mechanism. Maybe we need to change forms, procedures, regulations in order to close that loophole. But my question here is, how relevant is this, these indicators in a non-Western environment? Are we all the same? Has these indicators been tested in more of an Asian setting, an African setting? Do we all think alike when it comes to numbers and all these kind of things? So, because that will be in it, 
when I'm presenting something like this to a chairperson of, of a commission, he or she will often say, well, this comes from the US and Europe. I'm not really sure how user, you know, how applicable is, is this for my setting? Mm -hmm. I need to be able to say, no, it actually been tested in, in similar environments and it actually makes sense even here. And then I have some ammunition in my negotiations. And of course, they also have to be able to understand Walter's work, which is... Y yes, yes. Um, um, yes, yeah, sometimes we're having difficulties with percentage, so this will definitely be a challenge. Um, uh, but... Finally, then, my, my last comment, and that has to do with voter education. We spend often, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars on voter education leading up to an election. And then, as you've seen in our discussions uh, on election observation, they always want to measure uh, whether the voter education activity was good, effective, and reached out, and, and, and so on and so forth. And we do a lot of voter education, but we don't really know if it works. And we spend loads of money on face-to-face -face activities, public service announcements, billboards. But at best, we might have tested this material on staff at the headquarters of the Election Commission. On a few occasions, mo most recently, LIFES did something in the DRC where we did try to have a control group and, and these kind of things. But we need so much more of your academic thinking when we test materials before we start printing hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of these posters, how can we make this more efficient? Mm -hmm. We have different target audiences, sometimes it's elders, sometimes it's people with disabilities, and so on and so forth. We need to be much more you know, me methodological and scientific in, in, in this approach, and I think there's an enormous amount of work that can be done in that we can benefit from you. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Daphne. Three good points. And of course, there was the cost of election handbook produced by our colleagues here, but that was a few years ago now. So maybe we need to update it and so on. Please, Annette, tell us from international ideas perspective. You, you work on so many of these issues. What do you think are the priorities that you would like to see? Um, I would like to mention the Global Commission on Election Democracy and Security. Um, it did not come, come up here and I was, to be honest, a little bit surprised because this is certainly an initiative which put um, electoral integrity on, a, on top of the political agenda. And uh, Kofi Annan was the one leading this initiative. And um, so, and, and international idea, we, we hosted the secretariat. And um, a couple of months ago, the Global Commission came up with recommendations. And um, I mean, this should not turn into a presentation of, of the Global Commission, but I would really like to draw the attention on that report, because I think for all of us, and um, not only for international idea, but really for academics, uh, for practitioners, um, for us, I think idea is always a bit in between. Um, so I think it, it, it really gives a good guidance of what kind of areas we could look into um, from all the different angles. And um, so uh, certainly international idea, we, we want to, to bring some of the, the points forward and turn it into to projects. And um, I mean, just you said three, I, I'm, I'm allowed to mention. So um, I mean, I think one of, of the issues which, which is really crucial is on election observation. And um, I mean, a few of you have um, um, than papers on that topics, but um, it's not so much nowadays um, anymore about observation because I think this is done broadly. It's done to a point also where I think in some missions um, overcrowded. Um, but what is often missing is the follow up of the recommendations and also the, the role the civil society is playing um, as some sort of a watchdog um, because we should not forget that international observers um, they leave. Um, and it's even if they stay a couple of months at some point, I mean, you always detach because it's not your country. Um, you go from one mission to the other. But civil society, um, I think this is um, really in the end 
end of the day, the people we should focus more and the, the follow up of recommendations that it's not, and it's also, of course, promoting the electoral cycle and that we don't come up um, all four years and often uh, the recommendations are the same because simply no work has been done on that. And I think it's quite sad and it's, we're spending a lot of money on that and we could do much better. Um, so that's one of the, the issues. Um, Another one is um, certainly um, electoral violence and International IDEA will launch a, a global good um, this year, um, which this one I would also recommend to some of you because we have really put a lot of efforts and we have a long list of indicators and it's a very practical tool which can be used by EMBs, um, not only as a kind of early warning tool, but also to mitigate violence in case it happens. So it's very comprehensive and I think it's it's a good tool, but of course it's not um, all and more research is needed in, in this field. Um, and um, just the last point, um, and this is something what I'm still very fascinating, and, um, and a colleague of mine has um, now produced a, a how-to guide on what is the role of social media? I mean, we all have our smartphones and I've seen people with smartphones in polling stations. Um, some people, they Twitter results. Um, so I think, I mean, if you look at electoral laws and if you just look at the, the practice and also, of course, the integrity of elections, this huge impact of new technologies. Um, and it goes so fast. I mean, as soon as you come up with a research paper, it, it seems to be all the next morning. So I think we really, really have to look into that topic. And not much is out there. And it's to be honest, pretty, it's quite scary, <laughs> at least for me. I mean, when, when I see this and it's, it's just, I feel always like 150 years old because, um, yeah, it's every day something new and, and it has a huge impact on elections. So, yeah, these are the three topics I would like yes. to mention. Thanks. Uh, as soon as our project gets onto Facebook, we're told Facebook is passe, Google, <laughs> etc. And Annette, is the commission going to be doing any more meetings or hearings? It's finished its report, so it's really it's the follow through after that. Yes, um, it's promoting the report. Um, it was never meant to be a permanent uh, body. So it was meant um, to be um, commissioned for a certain period of time. And I think Kofi Annan was, was very much engaged um, also because of what happened in Kenya 2007. So this is a little bit of the background why that initiative started. And um, I mean, now it, the the, the recommendations, I, I, I honestly believe they are very practical and they are very good. Um, so, yeah, this is what I would like to And electoral sure. violence is certainly an issue that we want to take on <clears throat> the project as well, uh, because that's very much a concern uh, of Dr. Frank. And then social media is also a concern of one of our other uh, groups as well, mm -hmm. crowdsourcing and so on. Yeah. So they're all good topics. Eric, would you like to tell us from um, your perspective what you think is most important as the kind of coming agenda? What should we be focused on? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's really fun. I've been to a lot of meetings about election observation over the years, and it's really fun to come to one where there's uh, so much more serious academic focus, so much discussion about research methods and data sets and statistical measures and rigorous study of election integrity. And I think this is all welcome. I think uh, it's, it's still relatively new. Um, as, you, as you probably, no one in this room needs to be reminded, the whole field is, is really still young. Um, you know, 25 years ago, this idea of serious uh, election observation or focus on election integrity around the world really didn't exist. And since then, uh, as Susan Hyde has reminded us, it's become an international norm. And it's mostly good. It's made kind of a modest contribution to democratization in certain countries and to the sort of larger public good in the world, um, but, a, but a real one, arguably. Uh, and you, you have um, things like the Declaration of Principles of uh, Election Observation Organizations that is, is all positive. But that said, I, I have some serious concerns that uh, maybe um, others might want to think about whether um, my concerns are real or, or are right, um, that in a lot of ways, um, observation and um, maybe uh, election assistance as well, but I'm particularly thinking of observation, is less effective now than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, I think there's some ways I just want to quickly mention uh, that are kind of problems that might be inherent in the enterprise or that we've been dealing with all along. I mean, there's a lot of examples, but, you know, one category is the kind of the problem of how do you evaluate elections? You know, um, how do you avoid this 
pass fail free and you know making that magic words beyond free and you know saying free and fair elections and and you know the overemphasis of elections and the and and all those kinds of sets of issues that we kind of all know about and we've been struggling with for a long time and maybe they're they're not that easy to to resolve and there are issues about you know what the different institutions involved in this in this industry around the world, what their mandates are and what their biases are and what their interests are. Um, but some of that's just um, inevitable and it's just stuff to be aware of. And I think things like the Declaration of Principles are an attempt to address that. But there's some other things. I, I, I was thinking of mentioning three uh, sort of broad categories of things that are kind of, um, that seem newer to me. Um, they seem like unfortunate trends or you know challenges that at least I've become aware of, we've become aware of recently, um, or, or they've become more serious challenges um, that uh, I'd like to see, you know, over time, whether other people agree with these concerns. One is the whole kind of sense that what we call outcome-based observation, um, where um, how we as election observing, the election observing community feel about the political results of an election affects what we say about the process um, and kind of begins to run the risk of calling a question our uh, independence and process. I mean, part of that we've talked about here a little bit about the kind of low quality observers and the shadow market for observers that, uh, you know, certain governments might go shopping, forum shopping, which might lead to conflicting findings and competition among observer groups and such. And that's certainly a concern. But I think um, there's another concern, which is maybe more important, which is that the high quality observer groups, the ones that have committed to principles and are trying to do a good job, um, still find themselves kind of in this trap where sometimes they are, uh, what they say about an election is substantially affected, or at least it seems so sometimes, by how they feel about the outcome. And uh, I think a lot of that is subconscious. A lot of it is, uh, comes out of good motivations, but it's, it's making me worry about the observation enterprise. I think that you know, we have incentives to cover up flaws sometimes. We have incentives to worry about the reaction to our statements. So uh, in Kenya in 2013, we worry about um, you know, what's going to be the reaction. Is there going to be violence in the, in the, after the, we give our statements? And I think that has the effect, maybe subconscious, of us kind of, um, it affects what we say. You know, we downplay uh, some concerns. We, we're a little bit less focused on finding the truth uh, in exchange for trying to encourage calm and peace. And calm and peace are important values, but they're not necessarily um, the main focus of election observer groups, I, I, I think. Um, a second sort of general um, concern that I think has become worse, or at least I've become aware of, is uh, about transparency. Um, transparency of election observers and methodologies is, is one example of it. Um, I think it's as we, uh, we in the observation community become more sophisticated, we think in our methodologies and kind of what we do, uh, we also have an obligation to explain that to the audiences that are interested in our, in our findings and particularly because there's a lot of weight put in what we say. Um, not to single out any group, but an example that comes to mind of really a domestic group, but working with international assistance was the domestic election observation group in Kenya, which did a parallel vote tabulation, a methodology which any of you who know me and, and Glenn know we believe in very much, um, but then said that their um, parallel vote tabulation verified the official results. They actually called it verified and stamped it, when actually it didn't really. The, you know, there was margin of error issues and, and um, uh, the, the range of uh, results meant that they really couldn't verify or question the official results. Um, but more to the point, uh, they, we need to know, you know how they come to those results. What, you know, they need to tell more about what their methodologies are. It's true of, of you know, exit polls, of, of all kinds of methodologies that are used, and particularly as there's increasing emphasis on statistically based um, observation efforts, it's important that we explain you know, what we've done, how we've done it, and, uh, and let people uh, know about it. Uh, another example of transparency, not of, of, of us, of our community, but uh, of election management bodies. And I think the election observation community needs to, to remember that election management bodies have obligations in terms of transparency. So when the Kenyan Election Commission, for example, doesn't uh, share the results at the polling station level, 
it's really hard for us to be able to make an assessment when there's claims that the, the results weren't added up well, that there's discrepancies in the tallies. Um, there's really no way for, for anybody to evaluate that if they don't have that information. So it's important for us to encourage election management bodies in the world to, to be transparent, including one of the key examples is uh, about how the vote count works, even access to the tabulations, but also reporting of the numbers at the polling station level. And, and the international community has not insisted on that. They have, we, we have been willing to you know, say nice things about the overall effect of the Kenyan elections without you know, much uh, complaining about the lack of transparency. And th the final thing that uh, I wanted to just mention now is um, that I think we should be careful about our, um, the fixation with technology and technological solutions to what seem like fundamentally political problems. So in the voter registration area, in the process of trying to do quick transmission of vote counting results, uh, in procurement of equipment uh, for elections, um, we, we uh, people in the world tend to think that if there's a lack of confidence and integrity in an election process, uh, we should find a, a, a technological solution. But as Stefan said, these things cost a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of distortions that they create in terms of procurement processes and incentives different people involved in election management have in terms of procuring that, uh, and even you know, donors and development agencies. Uh, so there's sort of perverse uh, incentives created by it. And um, technology can help solve um, some of these problems, uh, you, you mentioned technology in you know, terms of uh, if social media is technology, but technology in terms of uh, crowdsourcing of uh, election observer reports uh, is a really interesting idea and there's a lot that can be done. But there aren't going to be um, fundamentally, uh, fundamental changes in how people perceive election processes where they don't have confidence in those processes because of technology. If, they, if we introduce technology, what we mostly do is we just change what they don't have confidence in. And, uh, and then it's even worse if you have, again, using the Kenya example, if the election commission ends up having all kinds of problems in implementing that technology and using it. Mm -hmm. So not only did they spend the money, they didn't even get the, the you know, expected returns in terms of efficiency and, and confidence. And of course, that also affects New York as well as Kenya. Absolutely. You know, they're going back to machines, swap right? machines. It's ridiculous. And Eric, the point about data, one of the things, just to echo Paul, is the, uh, when we're doing statistical observation and we actually have records, those aren't always available to researchers. So, uh, for example, European Union uh, evaluations which have a, a good statistical methodology, that data isn't available for us to look at and to really analyze. So. Yeah, I, I think we should be pushing, you know, and I'm on both sides of that discussion, but we should be pushing the observer organizations to, to be transparent and, and provide their data what, what, what they have. I think that's important and it's, it's going to improve the enterprise and improve confidence in the enterprise. And, and any research, as soon as you say data, as soon as you get it, then you know the next generation of scholars is going to use it. So it's the easiest way to get people in. You don't need to get them money, but get them data. And hey, you know we'll write about it, right? David, your thoughts about where we should be going? Thank you, Pippa. Um, my comments, well, I think, will overlap quite a bit with what some of the others have said, um, but maybe with a little twist on them in, in a few ways. So first of all, I would say. Um, while I've uh, talked a lot about um, how I think there's a convergence on international standards, I think there is a lot of work still to be done on the methodology of observation. So how do you take those criteria that exist in, in, in the international instruments and other sources, and how do you apply them in your work? And really importantly, how do you get to that last step that you know, we call their difficult questions? How, how do you, uh, what's the process of drawing conclusions, and can you be more systematic? Can we as a community be more systematic in how we do that? So we need help on that. Uh, secondly, something that's very uh, self-serving from the perspective of election observer organizations, I'd like to see more research similar to what uh, Robert uh, Mattes did, uh, has done in his uh, recent paper. Uh, we've tried to, uh, in our work at the Carter Center, explain that we see the objective that we're hoping to have an impact on is shaping perceptions. So it's not really necessarily about deterring fraud necessarily, and we don't think that our contribution on democracy is necessarily that great, at least by ourselves. But we do see our impact on being authoritative out there on our assessments are well-grounded and well-researched, we hope, and therefore they have some role in this mediation of how people perceive the quality of, of elections. So more research like that I think would be helpful for us. Um, related to uh, Annette's comment on follow-up, 
uh, one topic that has been discussed in our annual meeting of election observation groups since we started meeting in 2005, every single year we're talking about the challenge of follow-up and it doesn't go away. I think we're getting a little better at, at it, but we, we need to do better as a community and I'm sure that there's ways that we could benefit from more research on that. Um, I think it's also, it would be helpful uh, for researchers to focus on democracy assistance community uh, writ large and our different roles because I think one of the ways people get tripped up is they look at election observers. Early on research was, you know, election observers came and you didn't improve the country's democracy. I'm sorry, we, 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 we don't do that, certainly by ourselves, but we're part of a broader community. There's the technical assistance providers, there's the observers, there's the international donors, there's the policy community, there's the national actors, and you know we need to do more coordination amongst ourselves, but we also need to have research that can really try to parcel out those roles and, and their effects. Another area, election technologies, that um, Eric has spoken to and Stefan as well, uh, and I couldn't agree more, uh, and the cost of elections and the obsession on technology. I mean, we're, we're very, very concerned about it and the way it plays out. Uh, and, and our particular interest is the going back to the impact on the quality of elections and the degree to which they meet standards and how we as observers, how this complicates what has already been difficult in our work to put in you know, this heavy emphasis on uh, electronic technologies in the ele uh, election process. And lastly, I would just uh, point to the question of domestic observation and international observation and the nexus between them. And uh, again, as a community, we're increasingly cognizant and uh, agreeing that the future is domestic observation. It has to be. Everybody knows that. Um, but I also think there's still uh, a role for international observers for uh, probably longer than I'm going to want to be doing this. Um, but I think there's also a way that we can do more deliberately to reinforce each other's work. And we need to find ways to really maximize how we can do that. So a long list yeah. of different issues. And do you think, in particular, just to pick up, David, on the idea of the democracy um, strengthening community, do you think there are enough internal links? And do you think there are enough links to the scholars who are working in this No, field? both. Both are lacking. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, in our community, in the different pieces of electoral assistance, I think we don't talk nearly enough to one another. I mean, the technical assistance providers talk quite a bit. Yeah. The observers are doing more. Mm -hmm. um, our, our connection to the policy community is not very well structured or thought out, in some cases doesn't really exist. So uh, one of the things that the Global Commission's report has really put their finger on in a very useful way is the need for there to be more coordination on those issues yeah. and find ways to communicate more effectively. But again, David, how, how do we do that? What does I don't that, know. What does I, that don't, take? I don't know. You're supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're very incredibly happy to bring people in and to open up all our events and to have this sort of round table yeah. and so on. Um, but is that, but you need something more, right? You need something at the UN doing this, really. We'll, we'll come back to you on later. <laughs> well, and, and maybe the Global Commission can help uh, yeah. in terms of a, a role that it can play. Is one of the things I've been suggesting that they could somehow play a, a role in that. And, but on the, the, the gap between the practitioners and the scholarly work world, I mean, this project, I think, is filling a huge gap, and I'm very excited about what, what it can bring. Well, yes, we're trying. Uh, I'm always so aware when I go to APSA how what the gap, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, and, you know, how you start to bridge that. And even if APSA has the capacity to bring in practitioners and to involve a dialogue, uh, incredibly difficult. It needs to be sustained. You can't just do it once, right? Yeah. Matilda, your thoughts about where we need to go? <clears throat> yes. Um, I, the first thing I guess I would uh, need to say and, and coincide with what you were saying, the value that the integrity, elect, Electro Integrity Project is bringing to this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, on the, on, from our view, we, and one of the priorities we want to focus on is to move the discussion from this conceptualization of, uh, of uh, a free and fair election or a positive or negative assessment of an election or a, as you said in your introduction, introductory remarks yesterday, a black and white definition to something that's more comprehensive, that it's based on the whole of the electoral cycle, mm -hmm. that I mean all of the things that we've been discussing that is based on, uh, on, on the on juridical instruments that the member that at least in the case of the OES member states have approved themselves. Uh, so, uh, and this is not happening. When we go do election observation, the expectation is that we're going to come up 
a day or two later mm -hmm. and say this was an uh, you know say yes or no was right. it good mm -hmm. yes or no yes. and and we want to push the, the conversation with the media with the academia with the uh, uh, opposition groups especially with, when we go do observation uh, and, and explain that what we think is the role and the contribution of election observation and, and even the way that they should assess the elections uh, is in a more comprehensive manner. So, and I, I talked earlier about this concept of democratic elections that is also shared by all of us. We, on, in our view, and, and it was also discussed in the panel on Latin America, again, the challenges uh, linked to election day, have a lot of them have been uh, overcome, massive fraud doesn't happen, this uh, stealing of elections doesn't happen as much. I mean, in that, the way that it used to happen at least in the transitions to democracy in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean, but we still see some issues that, that were not addressed during these two days that, that still persist. Uh, we see violations of the secrecy of the vote and, and this is something that we uh, document when we do, you know, deploy, a, uh, do a massive deployment of our service on election day. Vote buying, it's happening and it's happening. I believe that it's even more uh, grotesque nowadays for some reason. And I've been doing election observation for, for 13 years. Uh, the electioneering and campaigning on election day around the voting centers, these are things that, that still happen and are not being addressed. And in a way, have some influence in the way that the, the voter exercises their right on election day. And then another issue that was that's linked to technology that was not the, uh, um, that we need to be talking more is the issue of delay in the transmission of, of, of results because of course not having who is the winner on election day generates certainty and generates peace and avoids electoral conflict so these are things that we are uh, you know dealing with that we see, we don't see happening uh, efficiently I guess is the word so the, the question that we're asking ourselves is oh, of course the first question we ask is are we comfortable with these things happening of course not but we know that we're not gonna have perfect elections so I guess one of the, qu the questions that I would love for for scholars to address and and I don't know if I'm sounding I'm gonna be controversial but with how much level of these irregularities are we comfortable with so that we can say that it was, this was a democratic election or that the integrity of the elections was not affected. Um, uh, uh, Andreas uh, was saying earlier, he was talking earlier about a reasonable threshold. I, I, I don't have the answer, but I don't know if we should think about, are we, you know, are we okay with having a reasonable threshold in terms of these things happening so that we can you know, say that this was a, a, an okay election, I guess. Um, so and, you know, uh, this would be, some of the challenges and some of the priorities and some of where we would like to see some research on linked to the day of the election and linked to the uh, cleanness of the of the election. But there's others that are linked and they were not really discussed over these two days and I hope that the second phase of, or the next phases of this project will address uh, are linked to the competitiveness of election and, and you know you said it David that are linked directly to the quality of, of the election. Uh, some of the things that we've been um, asked, working uh, on at the OAS uh, is how to assess how women and men participate in elections as voters, as candidates, and as members of electoral management bodies, both at the national level as well as in the decentralized entities. Uh, is there relative, I mean, uh, assessing the, the, the access to the media by parties and candidates? Uh, how vulnerable groups participate in elections. We have in Latin America uh, situations of uh, the voters, um, Afro-descendants, indigenous, but also displaced peoples. And, and, and we've encountered, at least in, in the case of Haiti, for instance, that our methodology did not have a way to assess how um, uh, those who were affected by the earthquake, earthquake in Haiti we're able to vote on election day and you know and we're not even asking how do how can afro descendants or indigenous participate as as candidates for instance or how they're covered by the media or how do they have access to to political financing um, some of the issues that still persist and of course we would like to 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 see more research on because in the way in in, in the end it informs the way that, that we approach uh, the subject is the, the use of state resources by incumbents that we see happening and not only at the presidential level in national elections i think it happens even more at the municipal level uh, at least in latin america the high cost of the campaigns uh, the uh, coverage uh, by, of the media uh, co media coverage 
to female versus male candidates and, and is there a, bi a gender bias in the way that they, they cover their participation in elections, access to information on the money coming in and out of the campaigns. That's also, you know, one of the main things that have that, that come up in, in our election observation reports and, and that's what we're hearing from, from key actors. And, and then the big issue of illegal financing or the money, illegal money is coming in the campaigns. At least these are the issues that are facing Latin American and Caribbean countries. Um, in, in terms of other things that this, com this uh, project and the community of scholars can also contribute, uh, at least on, on, from our point of view, um, is uh, the issue of assessing impact. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah, were, right. in the case of Haiti, we did an evaluation of, our, of, of that mission, of that intervention. And we realized that we really don't have a way to assess the impact of, of, of our work. And, and this is specifically related to, to election observation. But I was very intrigued and, and very excited to hear that uh, uh, Anna, uh, our colleague from Germany, was also assessing the impact and uh, trying to evaluate or creating a model to evaluate uh, um, electoral technical assistance, or, or what we call, in, 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 from our point of view, technical cooperation projects. It's, and there's, there's nothing. I mean, we don't have it, and that would be a, a, an excellent uh, contribution. Uh, just to add that how we think that international election observation can contribute to, in, to the integrity of elections, we think that by making our, our methodologies and our um, instruments more rigorous and by, by uh, documenting uh, what we're saying um, in our statements uh, much professionally, more, much more rigorously, we would be able to hopefully contribute to, to, to more democratic elections. The presence on over th throughout the electoral cycle is very important, specifically linked to what some of our co my colleagues just mentioned, the follow-up to election observation reports. Uh, we, we, we realized as a community that we keep producing recommendations, recommendations, and then we go back four or five years later mm -hmm. and nothing happened. So, uh, and we don't really have a way to track it. So, you know, if somebody can start thinking about ways to track it and see where, uh, you know, how this can be improved, that would be, uh, that would be very useful. And, and just a side note on, on, on an, an interesting work that the OES has been uh, promoting, uh, uh, and this is not only in Latin America and the Caribbean, but uh, at the world level. We are trying, we are conveners of a group within the ISO um, International Standards Committee. Mm -hmm. We have a working group that's considering the, uh, the approval of an electoral ISO, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a norm on, on the, on, to improve the quality of the provision, in terms of the provision that, that of services that EMBs give to electors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not, it hasn't been approved, but it's an ongoing conversation that perhaps could be of interest to the, com to the group of people that are uh, present here, but can also be uh, of use to the community at large. Uh, so I think I, I would summarize my remarks here. The issue of measuring impact for us is very important, and, and I think there's and, it, and it's certainly one which scholars are really interested in now for all sorts of reasons. Uh, evaluation research is really at the cutting edge of a lot of our work. But again, it's getting access, especially for younger scholars. They often don't know how to make those connections. So somehow we need a bridge. Um, and it can't just be a personal bridge. It has to be a more structural bridge that yeah, we yeah, need. Yeah we need to think about. Um, Aleda. Aleda, in particular, for UNDP. Now, UNDP does have a convening role very much in, the, in New York. Uh, we have a convening role, and, and in a way, we have a different role of most, uh, with perhaps this uh, yes. IFES and I idea. We do not do observation. Uh, the UN rarely does any electoral observation, only under the mandate of a Security Council or General Assembly resolution, which means uh, in all actuality that we haven't done electoral observation almost in the last 10 years. And, and, and the reason is uh, that uh, we see it as a conflict of interest because we are uh, providing electoral assistance in almost all these countries where observation will take place. We provide electoral assistance in 60 countries a year. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a conflict of interest, but also because there are others who are doing it much better. And, and, and the division of labor. It's you a division of labor. Them. Having said that, I, I think um, UNDP has been using the electoral cycle approach, and I would say not oh, the yeah, electoral cycle. Oh, we stole it from you. We stole it from yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Electoral cycle approach since 2005, and uh, when we started, uh, and actually this was, 
uh, the result of an internal evaluation we, that we have of the first decade of electoral assistance, which to, uh, told us that we provided uh, too much assistance too late mm -hmm. uh, and, and focus a lot on operations. And so it, it was a way, and, and this is not only UNDP, it was an international idea, it was IFES, it was a, a group of, of electoral assistance providers that is say, well, we had to, to, to change completely the way we, we provide assistance. And in our case, um, when we started, uh, when I started working at the UNDP in 2005, less than half of the, of the projects, uh, it was like one quarter of the projects only focus, focus beyond the election event. Today, uh, three quarters of the projects focus on the electoral cycle and only uh, one third of them have a, 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 a electoral, electoral event component because have it, focusing in an electoral cycle doesn't mean that you don't focus on the event, but uh, some of them really do not even look at the election event. Right. Um, yes. The and 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 I so in this sense we really appreciate uh, that uh, your your approach is looking broader and and here I will emphasize something that Anna mentioned earlier today is is go, the electoral cycle approach goes beyond uh, the temporal uh, and, and the inclusion of other areas of of electoral work but also allows to look at another actors so not only the EMB although uh, I, I have to say the EMB is still the the main source or recipient of beneficiary of electoral assistance is uh, just switching the 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 our lens and providing also to to the media to the police to the legislation uh, the parliament etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we uh, in the last uh, two years uh, we have gone through a lot of evaluations and lessons learned of, of our work and kind of the same thing that we did for, before the electoral cycle that pushed us to the electoral cycle and uh, and in a way confirm that very positively um, that uh, th this the electoral cycle has been very successful uh, but uh, also emphasize areas where we still have challenges in the field and and those areas i think could benefit from from your work one of those is uh there is not um sufficient link still with other areas of governance and so uh, yeah. how this we we i mean it has been mentioned during the presentations the the, the, the relationship between uh the democratic environment and the election event and, and, and electoral assistance, but still uh, our projects, our interventions are very isolated. So we, uh, yeah. so yeah. for one thing that we have found is that we have been very successful in improving the, the, the quality of the performance perhaps in of electoral management bodies, but in affecting the, the overall democratic environment, we have been less successful. So for example, in, in, in Georgia, uh, the, the electoral management bodies with all the support of IFES and UNDP and uh, or in general of the, of the providers have really improved the quality of, 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 of their work and how they're trained and, they, and, and everything. But still media issues are a concern, still uh, political uh, party finances are a uh, concern, uh, uh, but election violence is still uh, prevalent. Mm -hmm. So there are these other issues that are perhaps not the, the target of the, the, the electoral assistance, which uh, are very strongly connected, that are the links are not well done. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that we have uh, realized in, in all these processes is that part of that is how projects are, the assessments are essential, uh, both the assessment that the organization uh, do, but also the, the self-assessments that the, the electoral management bodies and the actors do of, of their work and how to improve. Uh, as, as first a step for for the 
for the programming cycle. Uh, so we need to improve that. And we are working on, on several guides to uh, guidelines, tools, and at the moment. And I think some of the indicators and or, uh, or the work that you do can benefit uh, the, that work. So that's one, one area. Other area that was mentioned here already by, by IFES, but also by, by the Carter Center, is the issue of uh, sustainability, cost effectiveness. And uh, as you know, because you were just in UNDP when we launched the, the core report, we have that product, but the, uh, I think it was a, a first good attempt, right. but very um, limited in, in a scope. The methodology could have been better. So we are now in, engaging in rethinking with, together with, with IFES on, on updating this, this, but in updating it in a way that is not going to be just a a product, but a, a tool that can be used by uh, scholars and, and in their work. So actually, I really uh, enjoy Alistair's uh, paper on, on, on relate, uh, connecting these, these issues of integrity and, and cost effectiveness. It's marvelous if different EMBs could report the costs in a common place, mm -hmm. so you could build up cumulative yeah. experience. So, so some of the things that we are thinking is more like a database exactly yeah. that yeah. could, but for that we need to, to really um, develop a solid methodology yes. for collection of that course. is, and for example, we have a lot of information through our procure, electoral procurement on different costs of materials, costs of, of machines, but this is very disaggregated by area. So uh, people who do electoral procurement, people who do ICTs and voter registration, uh, uh, scholars. So trying to come with a methodology that is solid on, on, on these issues, that's some of the challenges that we have. Uh, and it would be good to have uh, some, some of the people in this room, once we, we haven't put together this, but once we have it, it uh, to... Yes, to collect, uh, to to collaborate with you there. Um, well, let, let, let's then, if we can, Alida, let's bring in Chad, because I also want just to have a, a, some minutes for the scholars to respond to this list of issues and okay. how they can actually come back and think about real ways to, to develop these relationships. So let's, let's come back a minute for Chad, for your thoughts about where we should be going and what we should be doing at this particular stage. Of Great, I'll try to be very brief. Um, you know, we're talking about bridging gaps, and I think that uh, my first exposure to this group basically was IPSA in, 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 in um, Brazil. Yeah. And, oh, yes, and, yes. And, and yes. so it was, it was very interesting for me to um, go through the process here of a discussant looking at your paper and having it discuss. you know, and the whole process has been very helpful, I think, for me personally. And I think it's helped some of the work that we've done at IPIS, and we will continue to do so. But I think the other leg of the three-legged stool that's missing, and strangely, I can have my, I can be in that world too, is, is um, bar associations. I think the World Justice Forum and the Rule of Law Index is a very interesting um, aspect of measuring what's happening too. And, um, and I feel like as much as practitioners are different from academics, lawyers are even more different. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, to be in all three worlds is a little strange for me. Um, but I, I think that there could be um, lessons learned there as well. Um, I also think it's interesting to listen to the discussion of causality and, and trying to explain historical events. It's very good. But for somebody in the field, we need models that are predictive. I, explaining what happened five years ago is very interesting, and, but how do we, when I'm in the, on the ground and there's an election happen, I need to know where there are going to be pockets of violence so that we can react to it. I need to know where there might be pockets of fraud so that I can have investigators there so that we can right, have... Right. So I think if to turn it to be more predictive rather than explaining things, mm. for me, and I don't, that's a big, that's a large call, I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if the scholars, <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously, monitoring evaluation is something that we can all work together on immediately and is very much needed. And I think assessing the value of uh, uh, the um, the effectiveness of election management bodies is hugely important. I think one thing we need to consider is I think. Um, Technical assistance has had a real sea change. I think at the beginning of, of EMB management assistance, it wasn't assistance, it was we ran elections. We would send a body, and uh, Stefan was on the joint election management body in Afghanistan. The head election commissioner was Peter Urban. 
for the 2005 elections, where now we're asking the Afghans to run the election. Mm -hmm. And we're behind providing advice. They didn't make the decisions. Mm -hmm. We don't make the decisions anymore. And so trying to say that the effectiveness of domestic groups running an election is the same as when we had internationals actually running elections with unlimited resources, it's not a fair comparison. And I think when you're evaluating this, you need to, when you're looking at past elections, mm -hmm. you need to ask your question, who was running the election? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the internationals didn't do too good a job on the first Afghan election, mm -hmm. you could argue. So. Well, yeah. Stefan was on the commission. <laughs> 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 um, well, there were problems. I was on the fraud panel on the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, two other very quick things, and then I won't I won't say any uh, any more. I think that um, I think that uh, we also <laughs> need to look at the donor community. All of a sudden, is very very excited about giving money directly to local NGOs, and I yeah, yeah. and I, this may sound self serving because you know it, it takes money away from groups like IFAS, but there's a sense and and a and a belief that they're more effective mm -hmm. that these small groups. I read an article in Foreign Policy just today um, that said that these groups aren't um, beholden to the local government. They're, they're less likely to be pressured than the international groups, which I think is absolutely the opposite. Um, and so I think there needs to be some study on if these local groups are more effective than international groups. And I haven't seen anything on that. Right. And then the last thing is there is a body of law developing um, on the rights of indigenous populations. And I think Mexico is doing a lot of work um, on when when can indigenous populations have communal voting, for example. Yeah. You know, when it, in, in Mexico, if I I think it's for state elections, they can have commun I mean, for their own in elections, they can have communal voting. But federal elections, they have to follow normal procedures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting field right. uh, in Absolutely. the covenants of the person, the indigenous peoples. I think that is mm -hmm. that has been passed. I think there needs to be more work in that area, and that's all. So. And again, Andy pioneered some of that work on indigenous representation, but there haven't been that many people who followed up. Um, so I totally agree. Well, what I'd like to do is just, we've got a long list of, of different issues, which I think are incredibly important, but I'd really like uh, uh, people to, to comment on some of these. Please come back and give us your thoughts. Um, thank you all. Thank you for the, um, the list of research things. Uh, I'd like to, to throw some of it back to you and ask, um, thanks. Uh, for the practitioner community to also be an active part in that by um, making your information more accessible, um, more available, more transparent in general. I know there's been a lot of work in the past years with UNDP, with USAID and others to quantify uh, analysis, monitoring, evaluation things. Um, give us more access. Uh, there's no professional journal, at least not to my knowledge, since the IFAS um, one was discontinued a few years ago. Uh, that type of resource would be, would be very valuable, um, the ACE site in particular uh, is a great resource and uh, has so much more potential that can be developed. Uh, there are ad hoc m and &E initiatives going on between academics and the practitioner community. I think there's a lot more potential in that area as well. Um, and in terms of research opportunities and fellowships within these organizations for academics, uh, that's a, another huge area that could be developed on at the moment is, is really very limited. So. Fellowships and internships for the younger generation, of course, so they get experience and so on. Right. And again, there are opportunities. It's not that we're reinventing the wheel, but whether people know about them and how you get in. And I mean, this is what all my students at the K School want to know. How can I get engaged in, the, in this work in democratization? They find it incredibly hard to do so. Please, Thad. And then, please, James. To build on what several of the people were saying on the panel, it seems one of the things that would be very helpful, too, is given the importance of understanding capacities and understanding how to make elections improve over time, is, is examining this issue of management and management changes and policy changes that go on, not at the necessarily at the legal level, but more at the procedural level of how are you going to implement this election differently. And that requires a different type of study you know, that's much more in depth and really looks at how the elections are being managed on that kind of the ground level and then how does do certain changes affect voter attitudes the ability of of election workers to implement the election doing it seems that you all have a lot of the data for that if you do the follow-up work and that seems to be a very important aspect of all of this or making the data available for e us to do the follow-up. exactly so no exactly that sort of link james you'd like to come in as well and then please thanks for this very good discussion um I'm going to push back and be annoying on two points. One is this M&E uh, point, which is, what are you waiting for? 
Um, you have probably 10 PhD students in this room that would get on a plane tomorrow to go do monitoring and evaluation of what you're doing. Susan, are you down there? I mean, Sus Susan came up with the technique about how to do this, and she's done it in a number of cases, but it shouldn't take a Susan Hyde every election to do uh, monitoring and evaluation. And maybe it no longer needs to be on deployment of observers, but maybe on something like voter education. But there are people working on evaluation of voter education programs. It's not a mystery where these people are. It's not a mystery how to find them. So I, I appreciate that everyone up here is saying we need to do M&E, but why don't you just do it? Um, why isn't that a standard part of what you have to do now? The World Bank and their projects has to do monitoring and evaluation, and other development assistance people have to do it really consistently. But international election observation, and even domestic, that's not necessarily the case. James, let me to follow up on that then. So where do people go if they want to find the 10 good you know, students? Where do they? So obvious, where are they? I'd like to know. Yeah. And I'd like to know me how too. we measure the quality of these folks. That's right. The you quality of PhD students? I mean, Susan's probably got graduate students. I, I mean. trial type style, there's a wonderful research network that is tasked with this exact problem of matchmaking between practitioners and academics right. um, called EGAP, which I just came from yesterday, uh, Experiments in Governance and Politics. And there's no reason why there couldn't be, I mean, they, they have a network, they have places to advertise mm -hmm. for these sorts of things, and they're pursuing this model of how to best um, Match make, but I think also you could email this group um, with a request for PhD students because there are a lot of people just desperate for access to exactly these types of opportunities. But I really want these kind of practical links yeah. so people can match against people, not just say they're out there. But I mean, an easy thing is to say in every observation that we do, we're going to evaluate a part of it, and so that when you're thinking about your our, your response to an RFP or you're thinking about how you're going to deploy core staff and LTOs, that you know that you're going to have somebody there who's do, who's part of it is going to be to do this kind of evaluation. And at some point, it doesn't need to be Susan's PhD students or Susan. It could just be a staff member at your organization that is their technical expertise like we have staff members whose technical expertise is to do statistically based sampling so i right. let, let's just, let's somebody come back Stephen, go yeah on. Uh, just a reaction to this i mean when we're doing technical assistance we usually have indicators that we have to report upon which is the monitoring evaluation and 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 uh, on a number of occasions well in most instances they're not really looking at these kind of things you know it's like the number of people trained the number of posters uh, printed mm -hmm. and distributed, but none of them are measuring impact. You know, then we yes, have to right. then we have a rough one saying that, oh yeah, the the turnout increase from 55 to 58 percent. This is we spent 20 million dollars on, on on voter education. We just assume that was the payoff. That was right. the effect. Right. You know, that's how, how crude sometimes these tools are that we we given to to use. And the problem is that we do not get money to do tests. Yes, at least within USA, you've seen the, the rhetoric has changed when it comes to uh, we should do evidence-based evidence -based impact on these things. But the finances are not there. Mm -hmm. So we cannot afford right. to, to have control groups in you know, two constituencies and not run voter education material there. Sometimes we can then hopefully link up with research money. Mm -hmm. and marry our mm -hmm. access and, and to EMBs and so on with your expertise in, in, in designing and, and running these kind of uh, tests for us. Mm -hmm. Susan, did you want to come back on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I think a productive task <laughs> that this group could potentially do going forward is to highlight some of the problem statements, right? Things that we all agree. I mean, there's a number of them that were just mentioned. And I think that the stage that's sometimes missing is a group of interested parties coming together and thinking about how those problems might be addressed yep. in, a, in a specific point by point. You know, this is the research agenda moving forward. This is what we could do. And I, I just wanted to add that to the, to the list of suggestions is to say, what should we do about this um, access to you know this technology issue and, and what should we do about the how to make information more readily available that's that's good for everyone so i think i don't i don't know how to design that exactly but it seems like it'll be enormously useful for so 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 many people right, right. good um please sarah up here uh, yeah just one then, is there anyone from the oc here no. Um, I've been in discussion with them about getting hold of some of the um, uh, election observation data they have, and they are working on a policy doc. They've been working on a policy document for a little while now. They're working on a policy document on sharing their data with academics. So I have been promised that there will be some, probably some data available before too long from then. If anyone is interested in that particular part of the world, another point. Um, 
all these ideas, it'd be great if Pippa on your website, and project website, you could have some little forum where um, practitioners could say, it would be really cool if some academics could do research on this, and there's this opportunity we have to work with you. And then academics could say, oh, I really want data on this, or I'm looking for you know, an opportunity yeah. to do this, yeah. that, and that. And it's sort of a matching service, if you could be a matchmaker yourself. I mean, that rather than just sitting around here talking about, oh, somebody should do it, yeah, yeah. why don't you do it? Yeah, no, <laughs> it had been in my mind. Can I just bring Caroline, though, just on that question about access, because we're having problems still in getting access to the other stuff, right? To the other observation reports from the EU? Do you mean the OECD data? Yes. Well, actually, the OECD has two statisticians on all of their missions. One of them is Hans Smith, who's a Dutch professor. And Microphone. He has pretty much all observation reports for all OOC missions he's been on. He's designed those reports. They're incredibly thoroughly designed because he's a statistician. And he has them all sitting in his garage. So <laughs> apart from the political effort on the OSCE, uh, I'm doing with a Dutch colleague in the Netherlands, we're doing a lot of uh, dining with this professor to get those data. <laughs> and as soon as I get them, I'll tell you. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> They should become available at, at some point. It's just ridiculous. It's an incredibly rich source. More than the reports, though, it's the data. It's the yeah, yeah. Yep. The, the forms. He has the actual forms of every single observer that they filled out in the... That's right. So, yeah. Things are being collected, but Here's we're not having now. access and so on. Please, over, move it along. That's it. And then we'll get over. Um, there is a study about the impact of... Well, first off, let me say that I've taken plenty of comments. It was great listening to all of you. In fact, don't tell my colleagues, but I took more notes on what you said than what on some of them said. That's how interested I am in listening to, to the practitioners. But I want to say there is a study, the, not so new, but still pretty new, about the impact of international observation, and that's Judith Kelly's study, which is very systematic. And you know, the overall news is there is an impact. We don't want to overestimate it, but there is an impact. And I would say, too, that one thing that I would suggest that perhaps people on your side do this is, for example, you offered a very concrete question, a question I'm interested in, I know Susan and other people are interested in this question, is I'd like to know predictors of when I'm going to have a problem election. I think it would be interesting every so often for you to get on the phone and to call a couple of people and say, do you have 40 minutes to talk or can I give you... X amount of money and you write something in five pages, document where you tell me where this is going on, and then we could facilitate that information. Because I think, for example, that question you could answer, you know, you, if you have plurality elections, all things being equal, you know, I know the author on this one, all things being equal, you're going to have more problems on this one. And a couple of us have spoken about this. Susan has a forthcoming study which shows that if it looks like incumbents are going to lose, they're going to try to do funny things on election day, which may end up getting people killed. So I think that we do have responses to this stuff. Now, it can be hard if you're in the midst of organizing missions or providing technical assistance to actually take the time to read this stuff. But I think one thing to facilitate that is call people or talk to people every so often and say, I would like to have not a long academic paper on this question. I want five pages. And I think a lot of us would be rise up to the challenge. Mm, good. Please, over here, Andres. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, too, found this a very stimulating panel. Thank you. Keeps us awake at 5 o'clock as well. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I still want to introduce another polemical note. Um, probably reinforcing what I understand, what, what James said. Uh, when you are asking us for evaluating impact, measuring impact, I think either you should do it yourselves. Uh, that's what bureaucracies under the pressure of new public management demands do. Uh, evaluate the results or ask public administration people. We don't do that. I mean, we, we do it in, a, in, in certain ways, in limited ways, but we, we don't do it, I think, in the way you ask it for. I mean, we are political scientists. Uh, our key interest is in power, strategic interaction. We can't provide the certainties you are asking us for, I think. Uh, we can't be predictive. Uh, we will rather, if you're good for something, we're good for introducing uncertainty. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want something to, 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 to produce doubt, to increase your uncertainty, to, uh, to make you unsure about your impact, well, that's us to ask. Uh, 
don't ask us for administrative certainties we cannot can provide, I, I think. Quickly, can I just, oh, please, yes. Um, uh, James, I, did you want to come back on that, or are you just... I, I don't want to... I don't, I don't think anybody should be confused in that we don't do extensive monitoring evaluation. Right. We do. We do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. We count a lot of stuff. Yes. Who cares, right? But I think in regards <laughs> to the actual impact and long-term evaluation of it, practitioners need help. Donors need help. They've developed log frames, and 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 you should see. Uh, yeah. We have three project. I have I have three large projects in Pakistan. Each one of them has an extensive log frame. And does any of it really show that there's been extensive impact? I don't know. Right. And so I think the donors require of us things that probably aren't effective. And I think you guys could probably help us il illustrate that. I think. Um, and so I think that it's. And also, I think it has value when there is an outside. If we can evaluate ourselves, there's an incentive, as you can imagine, for us to say there was a great deal of impact. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it brings some credibility when we have an outside party involved. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, please. Please. Well, thank you very much. I think, the first of all, the papers that they were presented here are highly rich in all, this, in all senses. Second, if we speak about impact, I like your idea of a predictive model. Secondly, uh, one of the constant questions that the policymakers do is that there is no dialogue between the academics and the policymakers. Yeah. I think this group will have to be, we have to have more presence. Uh, within the areas where the legislators take decisions. Because much of this uh, is very, very important, and they have to know in the process of designing the institutions. I think this is one of the manners in which the impact can be more uh, real and concrete. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in Mexico, for example, uh, the legislators have relations with the national university, but uh, it's not often that they have a discussion with academics. As a matter of fact, they try to stay away, oftentimes, from the academicians. Therefore, I think one of the ways to promote and to have more impact is to have dialogues with the policymakers so that the, the conclusions that we you are arriving at in this kind of a meeting, uh, may, uh, they, they, they are somehow uh, incorporated in the design that they are making. Mm -hmm. And of course, political scientists have to actually translate their work into real clear good, effective. I mean, we're so bad. We publish in our journals. We assume people read them. Nobody reads them. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Just very quickly, we, w there's a lot of requests for you guys to release the data, but at the same time, you've sort of indicated that potentially there are strategic reasons why you wouldn't want to reveal that data. You can make these claims about elections, and you know that you've got discrepancies in the data. There are fraud things or they're not as clean as potentially you're, you're saying publicly because you want to reduce potential levels of violence. I'm not seeing an incentive there for you to reveal data in those cases, but you are likely to reveal data in cases that are where your public pronouncements do match the data. And so for us on the other end, I think we need to be careful that you guys are being strategic we need to model that strategic nature and recognize that the data that we do get given is going to be a selective, a selection of the data that sort of fits certain patterns. So we need to be careful. Okay. A lady, would you like to come back? And well, I think here will be a, a little difference with the ob observer groups because the data that you will get from an electoral assistance provider is completely different from an observer group. So in our case, all the project documents, all the project evaluations, even the thematic evaluation that I mentioned that evaluate, uh, is an independent one that evaluates our work for the last 25 years is in the website. The problem is that you need to 
know where in the massive website is hidden, probably. That is not user friendly. And, and I think uh, Gabriel worked for, for us for a few months doing some research and just finding our information for UNDP is like, uh, oh. the, like uh, people almost go, uh, went insane. Uh, it's not user friendly. That doesn't mean that it's not public. That's right. uh, so it's public, but it's very uh, complicated. Uh, it's very not um, intuitive uh, on, on how to access. So uh, some, sometimes uh, what the best way I find is that to try to find links to websites, places that people do use, for example, ACE, try to connect to ACE some of this information. So, for example, we have a, an online toolkit for our country offices, and we have put there at least 20 or 30 examples of uh, evaluations of UNDP electoral projects. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there is a database of UNDP evaluations that everybody could go, but it's so difficult to access that we just added to the, the, the tool. So, it's, it's it's just things. here, not to say that the, the information is not is secret or in under the, the table, is that just is not very no. user friendly. And even one UN agency can't access another UN agency's stuff. <laughs> well, obviously we've come to the end because people are leaving, so we must finish off. I just again like to thank everybody. I think this panel has been terrific, and I think that we need to continue it. So really, I'd like to invite everybody to come to Chicago as well. Right, that's our next venue, and it's with APSA. And so uh, it's in September on the date of August 28th. August 28th. So we've got a good diverse panel. It's a one day program. We'll give you lunch and all of that and dinner as well, maybe. Um, so we hope that we'll continue our conversation and not just, as it were, end on a discussion, but really think through, as, as Sarah says, how to do this in practice. Thanks to everybody. Great panel, great papers. And thanks for coming to <laughs>